Welcome, listeners. Today's episode is a new segment that I'm working on that focuses on crime, mystery cases, murder, and insanity. I don't hold back information in these episodes, and as a result, they're not for little ears. So please, any younglings around, turn it off, listen to one of my other episodes, and keep their minds safe. Today's topic will have content about child-related rape, sexual abuse, murder, necrophilia, and more. At no point will these episodes glorify the criminal, but the aim here is to get a glimpse into what made them, if that's possible, what they did, the human lives they unrightfully took, how they were caught, what took place during sentencing and after. I welcome your feedback in this episode, and I want to deliver as much polish on this as possible. So please, turn the lights off, lock your doors, and listen. Tsutomu Miyazaki, born August 21st, 1962, died June 17th, 2008. Criminal Alias, The Otaku Murderer, Dracula, and The Little Girl Murderer with an alter ego of the Ratman. Born in Japan. Criminal type. Serial killer, cannibal, necrophile, pedophile, child rapist. Criminal activity. Murdering young girls, vampirism, cannibalism, and body part hoarding. Number of people killed. Four. Sutomo Miyazaki was a Japanese-born serial killer that lived in Itsukaichi, Tokyo, Japan. Born to two parents, Katsumi Miyazaki, and one being one of Sutomu's older sisters, it is not specified which of his sisters gave birth to him. It was confirmed, though, that Katsumi Miyazaki, his father, had intercourse with one of his own children, and not his wife, that led to Sutomu being conceived. I was unable to identify which sister this was during my research. Sutomu was a preterm baby, which usually means that the child's birth takes place more than three weeks before the baby is estimated to be due, often starting on the 37th week of pregnancy. With varying ranges of medical complications and problems, Sutomu's birth was marred with one major deformity that would not only drastically impede his physical development, but have permanent and long-lasting effects on his mental development. Sutomu's wrists were missing their radiocarpal joint, which is the ulna and articular disc that separates your wrist joint from your hand. Without those pieces, your wrist is fused to your hand as one piece. I'll include pictures of Sotomu's wrists in the episode notes if you're interested. This lack of articulation means the inability to tilt your wrists past a certain point. In this case, Sotomu's wrists were unable to raise above the wrist joint and only flex slightly down and left to right making it really difficult to grapple things, pick things up, or hand objects to people. This deformity played a major role in his psychological descent into madness, both at a young age as a trigger and into his adult years where the acts of violence he committed were perhaps reflections of his inability to come to terms with his deformity, and not to mention the subject of profound abuse. Due to his deformity, Sutomu's life began painfully, with extensive bullying at a young age. The book Supernatural Serial Killers, What Makes Them Murder, explains that Sutomu was viciously bullied, unaccepted and mocked constantly for having funny hands, later referred to as Dracula hands. At home, he was treated with disgust by his family. His sisters found him repulsive due to this deformity, and Sutomu's parents were distant at best as a result. This constant bullying led to depression, pushing Sutomu into a life of solitude and loneliness. Relationships would have been perceived by Sutomu as something to avoid, only bringing more pain and sadness, rather than as a genuine relationship with love and compassion. After all, he's only been exposed to hate and cruelty. Now, my focus isn't here to build sympathy for a serial killer, but this is an opportunity at understanding his pathway into madness, with it arguably starting here. 
A life devoid of love. The lack of love and care from his family and peers play a major role in his future. And we'll explore later in this episode what he really wanted out of the people who were his family, only in name. If you're constantly hammered by your peers, and you have no support from your family, the one bastion that you would think you could retreat to when the world becomes dark and cruel. A point in your life where guidance would be critical. Sutomo was faced with a coldness that would freeze his heart and shape his mind as he grew up. One of the quirks that developed from his lack of familial bond had been seen quite early on, during family photos after the age of five. Sutomo would always close his eyes during a family picture, a sort of objection to the image, his rejection of being part of that family. But this wasn't what Sutomo wanted. In fact, one of the key desires of Sutomo when questioned about his childhood was that all he really wanted was being listened to about his problems, with him stating his family would not have heard me if he tried. And his parents and family life were so cold and distant that he would contemplate suicide daily. Being abused, not being heard, and without any moral support, an absent of love in any shape or form. Satoma was being molded heavily into the creature he'd become. If a child isn't given love, how can a child show love? So, despite Satoma's deformity playing heavily in his life as a handicap, with no friends and no family support, that did not seem to affect his school performance. Initially, Satoma was achieving high grades at school, and it seemed like he could push past this problem and find an avenue to succeed. But as the years progressed, his school grades declined drastically, dashing his chances at being an English teacher, leaving him to work as a photo technician for his father, who ran a highly reputable newspaper business. This would be yet another trigger that would lead Sotomo down a path of darkness, depravity, and murder. With unachieved goals, and the feeling of being a failure. His lack of relationship with his family and abuse from others throughout his life led him to struggle to make friends in his adult life. Instead of turning to others for moral support, he retreated deeper into himself, becoming obsessed with horror films, anime, fantasy books, graphic pornography, and amassing a huge collection of videos from various genres in that space. But folks, being into horror films, enjoying anime and porn, are not red flags. I mean, sure, the level that you are into those activities could lead to some red flags, but they alone are not the causal factors that create a serial killer. Journals and reports on Satomi make it out that the media he consumed was the issue, and solely the issue. The media he consumed only reinforced the desires he already had, but they are by no means the point of action by which Satomi would begin killing. That media was banded together with a genre of pornography that would have raised red flags. At the age of 21, Sotomo delved into child pornography, starting him on a personal path of depravity that would play the main theme in the murders he committed. And whilst alone in his room, no contact with others, the outside world, and just hours upon hours of time to burn to reinforce this twisted desire. But that, again, was not the trigger. Yes, of course it would bring issues of its own, but murder? Aggression, in my opinion, would be quite a leap. So what was that trigger? The trigger that blew a hole in Sutomu's sanity was a different consumption altogether. And it all came down in 1988. There was one person out of all his family members that meant the world to Sutomu. One of the few people in his life that gave him love showed him respect and supported what he did, and that was his grandfather. He loved him, respected him, and couldn't get enough of the bond that they had. In a place of darkness, his grandfather was the shining light. When his grandfather died in 1988, it was the straw that broke Hordor's back, mates. At the age of 26, Sotomo reaccounted that he consumed his grandfather's ashes, I'm not going to say I get it, but I understand in a twisted way what he was trying to achieve. In his own warped reality, he was trying to get as close as possible to him, the only person that loved him, to be with him just that bit longer, just that bit closer. He quoted that it was his attempt to retain something from him, 
But here is where it all began. Age 26, the death of his grandfather, created an irreparable crack in his psyche. It was that year that he began watching his sister as she showered, and when he confronted, attacked her. When his father's wife scolded him, he attacked her, and any sort of control exercised on him, he lashed out and attacked. The first real show of aggression, of rage, and evidence of Satomo losing control. No reports were made, and the incidents were completely ignored, again allowing this sort of behavior to grow, and a lack of care and love from his parents and family allowed it to fester. Tsutomu lost control on the day after his 26th birthday, which led to the beginning of four child murders in the space of 10 months, all of which were below the age of 7. Rest their souls the names of the children who were murdered by this creature. Marie Kono, age 4. Masami Yoshizawa, age 7, Erika Namba, age 4, and Ayako Nomoto, age 5. I wanted to include them here to be remembered, respectfully. People often remember the killer, and I often read what is your favorite killer in posts online and discussion boards. It sends shivers down my spine, mates. To me, researching killers is understanding the scenario and situations that created them, and not to idolize them as some pop culture plaything. People have died, these are someone's daughters, someone's sons, and should be treated with respect. The four children that he killed were innocent, but need to be remembered. Not in the shadow of the killer, but as an independent and great loss of life. And with great respect, let's learn more about the murders that took place. Marie Connor vanished whilst playing at a friend's house. He convinced the girl to get into his black Nissan Langley, taking her to a wooded area and then convincing her again to let him take pictures of her, talking to her for roughly half an hour to do so. She was then strangled, undressed, her body sexually abused, and then left there to decompose. Sotoma would then keep her clothes which is something a lot of serial killers do, a sort of sexual trophy for them, to recall what they did, and playing into his sexual fantasies, reliving those last moments. After waiting five months, he returned, cutting off her hands and feet, again to keep them as trophies, made easier by the decomposition of her flesh. But something would compel him to go further, to communicate with those that loved her, a sort of sick ritual of his own, he would then go back once more, burn the entire body to ashes in a furnace, leaving only teeth and bone ash, sending that to the family. I can't help but think, in a sick, twisted way, he was initially apologizing and allowing her family to be with her. So why do I think this? He ate his grandfather's ashes to retain something from him, in a desperate way to prolong the love from his grandfather to remind him of the love lost. And in kind, he sends Marie Connor's ashes to her family so that they can retain something of her, in some sort of warped realization that he's doing them a favor and acknowledging that he's done something wrong. Let me go one step further to push this. Alongside her ashes, he sent a postcard that read, Marie, cremated, bones, investigate, prove. Prove, folks. Why the word prove? Either a sick challenge or an insane person's plea to be caught. Apparently, Sotomo would then communicate to the media under a female alias, Yuko Imad, stating her responsibility in the crime, sending postcards like this back to the family under that code name. There must be a sense of guilt here, surely. Wrapped, of course, in a warped reality. An acknowledgement of a deed done wrong with the fear of punishment being the only deterrent. He would later go on to say that he himself never did the crimes. In fact, it was his alter ego, Ratman. And I'm not making this up. Ratman would speak to him and force him to commit these crimes. Perhaps a level of schizophrenia, hallucinations, delusions perhaps, that compelled him to do what he did. He even drew Ratman during his court hearings to describe the creature that possessed him. Or at least, the creature he thought possessed him. Perhaps the real issue was that he couldn't reconcile the fact that the creature Ratman was, in fact, himself. 
One and a half months later, Masami Yoshizawa was persuaded, captured and killed in the exact same way that Mari had been murdered, down to the same location, same intent. Just terrible. Two months later, Erika Namba, walking from her friend's house, was picked up and taken to Naguri Saitama, again forced to take off her clothes and pictures taken. This time though, leaving a postcard with their family that read, Erika, cold, cough, throat, rest, death. To me, and this is my opinion only, there is a clear shift here, a focus on suffering. Less about wanting to be caught at this point, more about recounting her pain. The words used are strikingly different, focus on how Erika was, and not on finding the body as the first postcard alluded to. His reasons for killing are changing, and the answer lies in the language he uses. The first postcard prompted the police to look, but now, it's discussing the emotional trauma his victim went through, and to his family. His mindset has changed, and to some extent he's sharing the thoughts that drive him to do what he does. He's enjoying what he's doing. A cruelty streak that didn't come across in the first postcard. Sotomu just kept on spiraling down and down. His final murder before being caught took place on June 6th, 1989. There was a couple of months gap because people in the area were beginning to get suspicious and the alert was raised after three children were missing. Now, some of you might be thinking, mate, bloody hell, three children have to go missing for this town to start getting worried or active about it. Well, Japan had never seen anything like this. It was, and to some extent still is, perceived as safe. This would be akin to Australia decades ago regarding security, where people would just never lock their doors until a thief enters and steals a whole bunch of your stuff. Then the attitude changes, right? The town of Itsukaichi was, frankly, unprepared. And with the disappearances happening so quickly, and no leads, with no real experience in this sort of crime, the police were left in a confused state, with the police at a loss as to where to start, and friends and neighbours accusing each other or at least suspecting each other of doing strange things, all acting as cover for Sutomu. The final murder was really where I believed Sutomu felt comfortable in what he was doing, and all essence of humanity foregone. At first he knew it was wrong, then he moved into cruelty, focusing on the pain and anguish then, it became normal for him. The fourth murder was Ayoko Nomoto, taken from a park, taking her pictures, strangling her, and then taking the body of the child home. So no different to the previous, except for taking the body home this time. He would then place the body on a bed, position her differently, and perform sexual acts on the corpse. Truly disgusting. There are images out there on the web from police reports with her tied to a bed, her arms slit, and blood all over her body. I'm tossing up between including those pictures in the episode as a link, but they'll at least be in the research notes that I use to compile this information. So please, when looking at the reference material, be wary of those around you. As serial killers progress in their killings, they push their boundaries, initially working within the limits of what they usually do, looking to enhance their thrill. And Sotomu is no different. This time, Sotomu waited for the body to decompose, slit her wrists, drank her blood, ate her hands, and buried the body in the hills in a nearby cemetery. And it was this last act that would lead to Sotomu's downfall. Now at this point, I want to surmise the first part of this episode. First though, some questions. Questions that I'd like your help with. Just your opinion, really, to see what other ideas are out there in this space. If Sutomi was shown love in any capacity by his family, would he have turned out to be a serial killer still? Was the first postcard a challenge or a call to be caught, trapped as a victim in his own mind by an alter ego? And lastly, was the second postcard the acceptance of his desires? Yes, these are purposely obtuse questions, but if you get the chance, leave your response in the comments. You lovely people are really diverse, and reading your thoughts helps me understand different points of view. I know in this episode I talk a lot about relationships, 
about family, about care, compassion and love, and my sympathy only extends to the point where his adulthood begins. I fundamentally believe that with family that was far more supportive, showed him love and interest on who he was, and monitored him during this time, his life and many others would have been vastly different. And what are your thoughts on the concept of favourite killer? Am I interpreting this wrongly? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Now folks, this is part one of the Sotomo Miyazaki episode. We've covered his background, who he was, what led him to perhaps turn into the creature he became, the horrible murders he committed, the people he unrightfully took from this world, and the town of Itsukaichi, one that was shaken to its core by the depravity of the murders that took place. So thank you for listening to the very first part of Sotomo Miyazaki. And if I've made any errors, feel free to correct me. If you disagree with my inferences, weigh in and share your own. This is an open forum, so I'm keen to hear your thoughts. Agree, disagree, doesn't matter. I'd love to hear them. If you like what I'm doing, feel free to leave an iTunes review or support the podcast directly on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash sfgt. Doing these episodes are morbid and they always leave a bad taste in my mouth but they serve to educate me on the horrors out there and the dangers to be aware of in this life. Mates, have a lovely day and safe night, and I'll see you again for part two, provided my internet doesn't turn into a potato. Also, this Friday, I'll be covering sentencing, family drama, mental illness, further murder details, the inner thoughts of Sotomo and Ratman, and more details surrounding the case. As always, mates, till next... We meet. Sutomo Miyazaki Episode 2 Welcome listeners to the second part of the investigative episode. This episode has adult themes present discussing child abuse, rape, murder, and death. This is absolutely not for little ears, so please get this episode or listen to another one of my narrated based episodes or even an old timey radio episode to pass the time. Before we begin, Respectfully, the four children that were wrongfully taken from this world. Marie Kono, Masami Yoshizawa, Erika Namba, and Ayako Nomoto. Today we're continuing the research and analysis of Sutomu Miyazaki, a Japanese serial killer titled the Otaku Killer by the Japanese media, and a creature of a man. Let's go through a recap. Four murdered children of which he ate parts of their body whilst they were decomposing, drank their blood from the wounds he inflicted, and performed necrophilic acts on their bodies. Sutomu was the son of an incestuous relationship between his father and one of his older sisters. He was born premature, which as a result led to a major deformity in his wrists, in which no wrist joint formed, making his hand unable to tilt up above the wrist joint. This deformity would lead to verbal and mental abuse from his family and his peers during the most formative part of his childhood and into adult life. Key areas of his psyche were impacted profoundly where social, emotional and reasoning faculties were severely stunted and would lead to aggressive and perverted behaviours. We also know that during his adult years he retreated into otaku culture which is equivalent to geek or nerd culture in Japan. The otaku culture also represents to some extent, back in 1988 Japan, a person who is an outcast, a loner, a person with no to little social standing, and frowned upon within society, often perceived as creepy, strange, or unsociable. This has changed significantly over time, and we'll touch on this later. In his early years, Satomi was alone for countless of hours, no human interaction at all, left to obsess and retreat into his otaku space and his own world. A world of horror, anime, manga, slasher flicks, and more. But that kind of media in of itself is not the trigger for this bullet. But early signs of perversion began from within, and showed at age 21 when Sutomo delved deeper into child pornography, an obsessive interest that catered to his sexual fantasies. Despite this obsession, he never acted on any of his urges. He either repressed them or didn't feel the need to exercise those urges. 
But there was a trigger point that ignited the fuse to carrying out those murders. That trigger can be traced back to the death of his grandfather. The only person that showed any kind of empathy or love when that life was snuffed out. So was Satomu's humanity. With the first break from reality, when he accounts consuming his grandfather's ashes and watching his sisters take showers, responding aggressively when confronted on either, his pathway moved from fantasy to reality as he began taking actions on his desires. Four murders took place as a result of this trigger between August 1988 to June 1989. And now, we're going to discuss his arrest, the trial, his alter ego, Japanese otaku culture, hoarding of VHS otaku media, and ultimately, his sentence. June 23rd, 1988 is when we see Sotomu pushing his boundaries even further, specifically his sexual fantasies. Sotomu was looking for another child in the area, and happened upon a park in Hachiyoji, a city in the western part of Tokyo, and found two sisters playing outside in the open area, near a park. At this point, Sotomu was getting reckless, because usually he only targeted and manipulated one child at a time. In this encounter, he would split his attention between the two, with the goal to separate them. Of the two sisters, he was able to convince the younger sister to join him in his car but was unable to convince the older sister who decided to go home. With the younger sister in his car, he began taking nude pictures of her and going as far as to undress himself completely, whilst taking pictures of the nude child. Bear in mind, this is a public space, but mind you, it could have been a quiet area. One article states that he became physically aggressive, trying to insert the camera's zoom lens into the genitalia of the child. But it was at this moment, where Sutomu was naked alongside the child, that the older sister came back with her father, where Sutomu was attacked, beaten, but unable to be restrained. Running from the area naked, Sutomu was looking to find his car as a means to get away. The father at this point had already contacted the police, and seeing as the police were already on high alert from the previous months regarding children going missing, they saw this as an opportunity to close in on Sotomu, ambushing him at his car and arresting him before he was able to escape, stopping Sotomu in his tracks for good. Upon his arrest, he appeared completely unremorseful. Questioned at the station, he divulged the information regarding the four murders he had committed, forthcoming with every detail and in a twisted way, happy to share what he had done with the police. His arrest is a victory for Japanese lives saved after that point, and high praise to the police acting so quickly in such a dire situation, and a relief to the entire city that he was put behind bars. Once arrested, he was interrogated for his actions, his mental state, and then sentenced. So what happened after his arrest? Right after being caught, Sotomu's house was raided by the police, and this fact always staggers me, because it's just… unbelievable. Depending on where you do your research, the number varies between 5,763 to 6,000 videotapes containing various levels of voyeurism, child abuse and pornography, hardcore or graphically violent anime specifically five minutes straight, of one of the children he mutilated, and the guinea pig series. For my Patreons, I'm going to include the image of all his VHS tapes they managed to secure. It's just crazy. I struggle to imagine where the hell you put 6,000 videotapes and the money to purchase all of these. It just gets more and more crazy the more I think about it. Now, have any of you heard of the guinea pig series? It's old. I mean, really, really old. And strangely enough, I know about it personally. I actually remember stumbling across the series around 10 years ago now. By accident, really. I was into horror and occult films back then, particularly those whose narratives were reflecting reality and the rituals carried out by monks in the past. 
So rituals where the monk is meditating and fighting the shaman and he's bleeding and being attacked and knocked around seem to just draw me in. There's actually a Netflix show that I watched recently that reminded me of all the old films I used to watch. It's called The Wailing. I highly recommend watching that one. It's a Korean thriller slash horror, but I digress. So yeah, I was into horror back then and still am now in a big way. And I particularly loved researching Japanese horror films, investigating the strange ones, finding old films bringing something new and bizarre to my eyes. The guinea pig series though, well, this would have been one horror series I would happily forget. During my research on these kinds of films, I noticed the title of a film I'd never seen before, one that was really damn weird. The guinea pig series volume 1 out of a total of 6. I watched one minute of it and just stopped. It was, and still is, traumatizing to some extent. But it served as a litmus test to my psyche that these films were films that I did not enjoy in any capacity. The films were focused on detailed gore, copious amounts of blood, and lots of awful other shit. To some people it would be ridiculous, and to others it would be disturbing. In fact, these films were so unnerving to audiences around the world at the time that the producer of the film had to provide evidence that none of the actors had been killed or injured during the filming of each episode. And here is a fact that people don't generally know about the case involving Sutomu Miyazaki. Of the 5 to 6,000 videotapes he owned, Devil Woman Doctor from the Guinea Pig series was one of them, which as a result helped the series gather infamous notoriety, cementing its place in horror history. So from me to you listeners, I do not recommend you watch these films. I really, really don't. To a point where I'm not even going to link the wiki to it. They are gruesome and unsettling, with the first two episodes being graphic in nature and the latter episodes moving into bizarre comedy sketches, mixed in with gore and guts. It's perverted in a bad way that lingers in the mind. Now, I do mention in previous episodes about media not playing a major part in whether someone would become a murderer, and I stand by that still. But someone with a degree of mental illness, possibly schizophrenia in Sotomu's case, a high level of emotional abuse from his parents and peers, physical shortcomings, Sotomu felt that he had lower than average sized genitalia, and unrelenting rage at society from years of abuse and being surrounded by and having access to media that focused and supported his thoughts on murder, death and gore could to some extent have inspired him. On the other hand, to me, even at a younger age, films like the Guinea Pig series had me seriously repulsed by what I was watching, and I wasn't able to watch the film in its entirety, shocked rather than entertained. So who knows the kind of impact these films had on Tsutomu Miyazaki's mind. After Sutomo's arrest, he was interrogated by the police, but his behavior was extremely bizarre, not making any sense, and blaming the actions regarding the murders of cannibalism, vampirism, and necrophilia on someone or something completely unexpected. He disassociated himself completely from the murders he committed, having developed an alter ego, a sort of Jekyll and Mr. Hyde personality. Mr. Jekyll being Sutomo and Hyde being the ego he called Ratman, a name you would have heard in the very first episode. And I've been asked why I constantly refer to Satomu's grandfather's death as playing an integral part in his spiral into madness, because I believe that trigger is what created the alter ego Ratman. Amongst discussing his actions around that time in 1988, one of the promises that Satomu made to himself by his alter ego Ratman is that in doing what Ratman wanted, Sotomu would have his grandfather back. The beginning of the end of his descent into madness. The thought of getting his grandfather back, the only person who ever showed any compassion, was always at the forefront of his mind. If this is true, it is terrifying how far Sotomu would go for the love of his grandfather, which in itself is fundamentally a problem. At times in his questioning, Ratman was a separate entity, 
forcing him to act on command, whilst other times it would be inside him, controlling him, stating that the murders he committed were all in his dreams, not actions carried out by himself or on his own accord. And this Ratman ego would be a defining factor on how he was sentenced. But before we move into sentencing of this creature and tortured soul, the case had a major impact on the Japanese culture at the time, directly as a result of Sutomu's murders. The media pushed the image of Sutomu as a figure that represented the otaku culture in its entirety. He represented a warning regarding the otaku culture and what to fear from that lifestyle. Vilifying anime, manga, hobbyists and nerd culture, demonizing them with one brush. Consistently, the media deemed Tomu as the otaku murderer or nerd killer, changing the social lens of what previously were people who were perhaps lonely, isolated, depressed, or just simply passionate about anime, manga, and the hobbies they're into, turning their image at the time into potential killers. So, not only are these people already ostracized by mainstream culture, their family and peers, they are now being hammered into the ground mercilessly by the media, creating a divide between people in that subculture that would take 24 years to repair. With a report estimating that 23% of the Japanese population in 2014 would consider themselves otaku, I used the 1988 Japanese population figures to take a rough guess at how many otaku would be present in Japan at the time, with the ratio of 23% from the 2014 study, and the population being 122.6 million people in 1988, that's roughly 25 million Japanese people identifying themselves as otaku. That's roughly 25 million Japanese people identifying themselves as otaku. And at that time, they would be even more alone, even more isolated, and heavily criticized. An awful position to be in and a breeding ground for relationship problems and cultural delinquency. To put this into perspective, mates, just at the gravitas of how many people this is, Australia's entire population was 16.53 million people in 1988, and right now, we only have 24.7 million across all of Australia. I'm just blown away at the population gaps and that only 23% of Japan is still larger than my country's entire population. Sheesh. Now we're going to move into what happened during Sotomu's sentencing and what the outcomes were in the course. During his court hearings, Sotomu was seen rambling to himself, constantly talking about his alter ego, Ratman, and to the jury, he stated that what he did were acts of benevolence and was doing them all a favor. When psychologists interviewed him during the time of the trials, they deemed him sane with the severe case of schizophrenia, whilst other psychologists that interviewed him said he had no apparent disorder. So I have no idea what was going on there, or whether the diagnosis was set up, or what I guess defines insanity in the eyes of the Japanese court. Dr. Susuma Oda stated that Sotomu killed for enjoyment, as thrill killings. Combined with his disassociative disorder, the murders he committed were considered characters in a comic book that was his life. Lastly, a psychotherapist Akira Ishii stated that he was a pedophile first and a killer second. And it was in this killing process that he was able to possess the children in their entirety and show his interest in them, which I can only assume is his twisted view of love and care. Again, I drag us back to the moment where Sutomu ate the ashes of his grandfather, his first realization and means to bring those that he loves close. And in this case, fantasies closer to him turning the imaginary into reality and fiction into physical. The initial step into his pathway of depravity. The low and high courts charged him with abducting and killing four girls. During the trials, his father refused to support him in his defense and later committed suicide in 1994. So Tormo was sentenced to die by hanging on June 17, 2008, a mere 11 years ago at the age of 45. And the death sentence still applies in Japan to this day. Chief Justice Tokiyasu Fujita, January 2006, when discussing the reasoning behind killing Sotomo Miyazaki, he said this. 
the atrocious murder of four girls to satisfy his sexual desire leaves no room for leniency. When questioned specifically whether he would apologize to the family and to his peers for the awful actions he committed, he said he had done a good job. Zero remorse for sending the postcards, the ashes, and the phone calls he would make to their families after he murdered their children. The trial in all lasted seven years, with his mother, one of his older sisters, bringing him comic books during that time. The last words he had before going to his death are strange and bizarre. Of all the things you could imagine to be said in this period, this is what Sotomu said. I'm going to get you, Batman, I swear, if it's the last thing I do. In those last words is a creature lost in nonsense, wrapped in cruelty, and consumed by insanity. But in those last words, the city of Itsukaichi and its nightmare would be at an end. His attitude brings to mind a level of absurd narcissism, where he thinks he's the hero of his own comic book. But in reality, the fact that it took 3,000 days of interviews from the police and 50,000 missing person posters to catch the creature that terrorized a town just proves one thing. That Sotomu Miyazaki was not the hero. He was the villain.